The game you are about to see was played in the second round of the famous tournament in Hastings in 1895. It was arguably the strongest tournament in chess history at the time it occurred, and an unknown young American Harry Nelson Pillsbury sensationally took the first place, finishing the tournament ahead of the strongest players of that time, such as Lasker, Steinitz, Chigorin and Tarash, among others. In this game Pillsbury initiated an attack by playing knight e5, which will later become typical and will be called the Pillsbury attack. There even was a saying among chess players of that time which went like this, if Pillsbury has played knight e5, then black is lost. Pillsbury carried out the attack in a very resourceful way and concluded it with a brilliant knight sacrifice, followed by an unexpected quiet move which came like a thunderbolt from a clear sky. Pillsbury started with d4 and Tarash played d5, so they played the Queen's Gambit declined, bishop g5, bishop e7, knight f3, knight d7, rook c1, castle kingside e3, and Tarash played b6. c6 is a more common and probably a stronger move. But b6 is also a perfectly playable move, the idea is to prepare the fianchetto of the light squared bishop in order to take under control indirectly, as the d5 pawn is blocking the bishop's way, the e4 square, a very important central square, and then the knight of course will jump on e4, supported by the bishop and by the pawn, and will be ideally placed on this square and exert a strong pressure on white's position. C takes d, e takes d, bishop d3, bishop b7, castle kingside, and c5, attacking the center, and also preparing, maybe, the advance of the pawn, c4. And here Pillsbury played rook e1, which is a dubious move. It is a loss of tempo, because white cannot play e4 anyways, because this square is under black's control. Instead of rook e1, it would have been better to play either bishop f5, which is recommended by the modern theory, or Karl Schlechter's move, queen e2. But Pillsbury played rook e1. And Tarash plays c4, and now Tarash's plan is clear. He has created a pawn majority on the queen side, three pawns against the two pawns, and he is going to advance the b pawn and then create a passed pawn by playing c3. And c4 came with a tempo, of course, so bishop b1. And a6, preparing b5. And Pillsbury starts his classic attack, knight e5. The idea is to reinforce the knight with the next move, f4. And if black captures only 5, white will capture with the f pawn. And the pawn on e5 will be ideally placed, exerting strong pressure on black's position. And the f file will be open. And the rook on the f file will exert a strong pressure too. And black cannot capture the knight immediately, because after knight takes e5, d takes e, the d file is open. And white exert very strong pressure on the weak d5 pawn. And the, one of the defenders of this pawn, the knight, is also pushed away from f6. And, for example, if knight e4, then simply bishop takes e7, queen takes, and the pawn on d5 falls. And if queen takes e5, then simply knight takes b6. Or, instead of knight e4, if the knight retreats on d7, then uh, the knight is attacking the pawn on e5, but simply bishop f4 defending it, and again the pawn is under attack. And if knight c5, in order to defend the pawn, then simply queen d6, d2, and after b5, rook d1, again the pawn falls. That's why after knight e5, black cannot capture on e5. And Tarash simply continues his plan, b5. And now f4, of course. So, while black's plan is to create a passed pawn on the queen side, white's plan is to create an attack on the king side, and personally on the king. White's plan is straightforward, queen f3 followed by queen h3 and creating deadly checkmating threat on h7. The only defender of h7 is the knight on f6, but first white will eliminate the defender of this knight on d7, because if white captures immediately on f6 then d7 knight will replace it, so first white will capture on d7, then white will capture on f6, and then queen h7 will be checkmate. That's why rook e8 vacating f8 square for the knight. And from f8 the knight will protect the h7 square. Queen f3, knight f8, knight e2, knight e4 centralizing the knight. And also 
blocking the bishop's diagonal and also this move leads to the exchange of the bishops and uh, Tarash hoped to ease the tremendous pressure on his king side and this exchange really did decrease the pressure as you will see bishop takes e7 rook takes e7 now this knight on e4 is simply intolerable that's why Pillsbury exchanges it bishop takes e4 d takes e queen g3 and the white knight is also intolerable it's a great centralized knight that's why Tarash pushes it away f6 and knight g4 now white is threatening to capture on f6 because g7 pawn is pinned because of the x-ray and also knight h6 check is threatened followed by knight f5 that's why Tarash moves his king to the corner king h8 and now f5 exerting pressure on the king side and also which is even more important vacating the f4 square for his pieces and as you will see this square will be will play very important role in white's attack white will use this square as a transition square for his pieces the knight will jump on f4 creating very unpleasant threats the rook will also move to f4 so this square is very important queen d7 attacking the pawn Rook f1, defending it. And Tarash played rook d8, which looks a little bit strange. It's not clear what the rook is doing on d8. Instead of rook d8, uh, Grandmaster Alexander Chernyaev, who wrote a book on Pillsbury's best uh, games, recommends rook c8, because right away b4 doesn't work, because c4 pawn would fall in this case. So first, it's important to defend the c4 pawn. So rook c8 exactly does this. It defends the pawn and then black would be able to play b4. Or instead of rook c8 or rook d8, uh, Kasparov in his book uh, on his great predecessors recommends rook e8 to defend the pawn on e4 and then prepare the advance of the b pawn. However, Tarash played rook d8. Rook f4 followed. And uh, now Tarash played queen d6, which is a little bit passive. It's not clear what he achieves with this move. Probably he wanted to pin the rook. Instead, Kasparov recommends more energetic bishop d5, with the same idea, to defend the pawn on c4 and prepare the advance of the b pawn. But Tarash played queen d6. Queen h4. Rook d8. So now it's clear that rook d8 was simply a loss of tempo. So the uh, rook is uh, moved to e8. From e8, it defends the pawn on e4. And knight c3. At first sight, this move is strange because it lets black uh, play in accordance with his plan to play b4 with tempo attacking the knight. However, b4 would have been a mistake because knight would be able to jump on a4 followed by knight c5 and on c5 the knight will simply uh, would simply dominate the queen side and the center that's why of course Tarash didn't play b4 and played bishop d5 defending the pawn and uh, Tarash of course isn't afraid of the exchange of his light squared bishop for the knight because his bishop is bad it's limited by its own pawns uh, it might look dangerous to capture on d5 because the queen will be distracted from d6 from where it defends the f6 square however this wouldn't work after knight takes d5 queen takes d5 the um, sacrifice on f6 doesn't work because after queen takes f6 check black has simply rook g7 move and white doesn't have any attack that's why uh, pillsbury continues um, his maneuvers he plays knight f2 and here comes a strong move by Tarash, queen c6, in order to take under control the a4 square, so that after b4, the knight cannot jump on a4, so now everything is ready for the advance of the b pawn. Hillsbury plays rook f1, now all his pieces, except the knight on c3, are on the king side, so he is going to create uh, to start an attack at the moment uh, he hasn't created any immediate threats yet b4 while black already has far advanced pawns and uh, it seems that black is faster black is already achieving what he wants while white still hasn't created an immediate threat 92 and here tarash made a mistake he played queen a4 attacking the pawn on a2 however this is a very slow because 
Black will capture on a2, the queen will be out of play on a2, so the queen uh, and it will also block the a pawn. So then, after capturing on a2, the queen will be forced to return queen a4, queen c6, then a5, a4. So all this will take a lot of time. That's why instead of queen a4, it would have been much better, much more energetic to play immediately c3. So creating immediate threats. Now the pawn is even further advanced. And now, for example, if b takes c, then after b takes c, the b file is open and the c4 square is vacated for the bishop. The bad bishop would be activated. The bishop um, will be uh, exchanged probably uh, with the knight on e2, which is very important, uh, which it defends uh, the promotion square. And then the rook will join the attack, either rook b2 or rook b1, and the pawn will advance. So that will create immediate threats. Or after c3, if instead of b takes c, if white plays b3 in order to keep the files, the b file closed, then still a5 energetically and after knight c1 uh, to uh, defend the queen side a4 and white still hasn't created any real threats on the king side while black will already open up the queen side so that's why in this position c3 would have been much more energetic but Tarash played queen a4 attacking the pawn on a2 and now Pillsbury gets a chance he gets time to start his attack, active play on the king side, because uh, in the previous variation his pieces would be forced to uh, defend the queen side, his pieces would be distracted for the defense of the queen side, but now he gets the time and he plays knight g4. And this move also indirectly defends the pawn on a2, because if queen a2, then simply sacrifice on f6. Now it works, knight takes f6, g takes f, Queen takes f6 check, and after rook g7, rook g4 attacking the pinned uh, piece, threatening simply to capture with checkmate. White is winning because rook e7 doesn't work, because rook must defend the knight, and the queen is too far away. The queen isn't on a4, it cannot return to the defense of the king side. So that's why after knight g4, Arash plays knight d7 in order to defend f6. And now again, he wants to capture the pawn on a2, but another strong move uh, followed. Rook f2, again indirectly defending the pawn on a2, vacating f4 square for the knight. And also the rook plays important defensive role, defense of the second rank. Now if queen takes a2, Kasparov gives the following variation. Knight f4 creating two threats, knight takes d5 and knight g6 check with a fork capturing on e7. The only way to parry both threats would be bishop f7, but a strong move d5, threatening d6, trapping the rook. And now if rook c8, vacating the retreat square for the rook, then simply knight g6 check, bishop takes g6, f takes g, threatening checkmate on h7, and after knight f8, defending h7, knight takes f6, again works. g takes f, Rook takes, threatening to capture on f8, and after knight takes g6, rook takes g6, the pawn is pinned, and white is winning after queen takes b2, queen takes e7, and the pawn simply advances. Or, instead of rook c8, if knight e5, then simply knight takes f6, g takes f, queen takes f6, check, king g8, d6, Rook d7 and knight e6, that would be devastating, threatening checkmate on g7 and the knight is under attack. That's why after rook f2, again Tarash doesn't have time to capture the pawn. And he plays king g8, moving away from h8, so that after knight f4, white doesn't threaten knight g6 check. Because now the pawn isn't pinned. And now Pillsbury defends the pawn directly. Now the pawn is defended. And c3. b3 in order to keep uh, the queen side closed. And queen c6 followed. So what to do now? Black is going simply to move the pawn and open up the queen side. And what white is going to do? It's not clear. White has only the knight and the queen 
on the king side and the pawn but it isn't enough to white doesn't uh, have any direct immediate threats and it's not clear how white is going to uh, increase the pressure how white is going to create uh, immediate threats what to do with the rooks how are they going to be involved in the attack the only square is f4 but where will the rook move from f4 so it seems that white's attack is over white failed to create the attack however pillsbury found the hidden resources for the attack he plays h3 at first sight it's a strange move what has h3 to do with the attack however it is the start of the attack Pillsbury vacated the h2 square for the knight because the knight is blocking the g-pawn so the knight will move on h2 then the g-pawn's way will be open g4 g5 then rook will move because the g2 square will be vacated too rook will move on g2 and will exert strong pressure on the g-file a5 so Tarash is playing on the queen side knight h2 a4 g4 a takes b a takes b and here Tarash made a mistake it's a natural move of course he played rook a8 his idea is to um, move the rook on a3 attack the pawn for the second time capture it after which he will get two connected passed pawns however first it was important to defend the king side and black actually had uh, also had hidden uh, defensive resources which was indicated by grandmaster fine so white is threatening to play g5 that's why it was important to make a prophylactic move h6 now g5 doesn't work what to do the only way to continue the attack would be queen g3 opening the h pawn's way so that after h4 white can renew the threat of g5 however now black has a great defensive knight maneuver knight f8 h4 and everything is ready for g5 but knight h7 again taking under control g5 square if g5 then h takes g h takes g and knight takes g5 after this black would have defended everything and then only then black could have continued the active play on the queen side in this case according to grandmaster fine black would be better but arash played instead of h6 he played rook a8 and according to grandmaster fine from now on pillsbury plays ideal chess and finds the best attacking moves so g5 of course rook a3 knight g4 so now the knight is activated creating threats on f6 not immediate but still and now tarash makes a serious mistake if his previous moves were just inaccuracies now it's a blunder he continues his straightforward play on the queen side and captures on b3 completely ignoring pillsbury's threats on the king side instead of this it would have been better to capture on g5 attacking the queen and after queen takes g5 white is threatening to play f6 but knight f6 blocking the pawn and uh, of course now if white captures the queen will capture and after rook g2 renewing the threat now white is threatening to capture on f6 and after queen takes of course queen takes and the pawn would be pinned but black has a simple move king f8 now again uh, the capture doesn't work because black will simply capture and the pawn isn't pinned the king escapes to the queen side and only after that black captures on b3 and uh, then white will have serious problems in this case but Arash captures on b3 immediately and neglects Pillsbury's threats and of course rook g2 follows and now f takes g doesn't work because the rook is already on g2 after queen takes g5 knight f6 doesn't work because of simply knight takes f6 queen takes queen takes and the pawn is pinned so that's the role of one tempo in chess that's why as the rook has created very unpleasant x-ray and white is threatening to capture on f6 Tarash again for the second time in this game moves his king to the corner of the board king h8 
And Pillsbury, of course, captures on f6. And here comes another inaccurate move by Tarish. He captures with a pawn, probably to keep under control the e5 square. But it would have been better to capture with a knight, leaving the e5 square unguarded. White, of course, in this case, would have played knight e5, attacking the queen and threatening knight g6, check, winning the rook. So white is winning the exchange. However, after queen d6, yes, white is winning the exchange. However, black has his own chances. Black has two connected passed pawns and white is slightly better. White is up an exchange. However, black also needs simply two moves to promote. And the second pawn will also um, support the C pawn. So it wouldn't be that easy for white to convert the exchange in this case. But Tarash captures with a pawn. And now Pillsbury's attack becomes unstoppable. So first he eliminates the bishop because the bishop also plays an important defensive role. He captures on b3. And after rook takes b3, knight h6, creating a checkmate in one threat. Rook g8 checkmate. That's why rook g7, rook takes g7, king takes g7. So, what to do now? It seems again that white's attack is it failed. Because black is simply threatening to again to escape to the queen side. For example, if white makes a natural looking move king g1, king h1, in order to activate the rook, so rook g1 check is threatened, but simply King f8 would have followed, and white doesn't have anything. But Pillsbury found a great move. You can pause the video and try to find it. So, he plays queen g3 check, leaving his knight unguarded. And it turns out that black is forced to accept the sacrifice. The king cannot escape anymore. If king h8 then of course checkmate in one move and if king f8 then after queen g8 check black is losing the rook that's why black must capture the knight but now the king is in trouble it is cut on the g file and white creates checkmating threats at first sight the strong move which is winning on the spot rook f4 threatening rook h4 checkmate doesn't work because black simply has check on b1 and perpetual check in this case would have followed but Pillsbury found a great quiet move king h1 and it turns out that black has no defense against rook g1 now the rook cuts the king on the g file followed by queen h4 checkmate so Tarash plays queen d5 now Rook g1, queen takes f5 in order to block the queen. But after queen h4 check, queen h5, queen f4 check, it turns out that black must give up the queen, queen g5. However, still, it's not that easy. It's not that simple because black still has a passed pawn. Black needs sim simply two moves to promote to queen. But queen d6 check followed and the king has only two moves. If king g7, then the knight falls with check, with tempo. That's why Tarash played king h5. But now it turns out that queen takes d7 again comes with tempo. Because black simply doesn't have time for uh, the advance of the pawn. Because queen takes h7 would be simply checkmate. And h6 doesn't work either because queen f7 would be double attack. So that's why black's position is hopeless and as a sign of resignation probably, Tarash still played c2 and Pillsbury checkmated h7. Hit the like button as it's really helpful for the channel growth and subscribe. See you in next videos.